Welcome friends, uh, today's topic is going to be that on, as we gather together online, is the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, and the beast. And uh, there are much talk and speculation as the description of who the man of lawlessness is, the Antichrist, and the beast. And of course, uh, with the end time speculators out there, the, especially since... Uh, the pandemic, um, we've been bombarded by end time speculations triggered by crisis after crisis after crisis. We had the Ukrainian crisis, now the Palestinian crisis, and they keep on coming through who the man of lawlessness is or the Antichrist is um, and who, the beast. <clears throat> and there's a lot of human inter interpretations to a biblical perspective, recognizing that we have to be very discerning as to what is the truth. And hopefully in today's topic, as we delve into some of the uh, thoughts in 1 John, Revelation 13 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, as best as we can, we're going to try and dispel some of the misconceptions. We're going to look at what is currently being, uh, what current thought is what's been uh, maybe um, spoken through theological circles, through on the internet, uh, the different types of frameworks that has been introduced out there, the rapture, the seven-year tribulation, the thousand-year reign of Christ. He's gaining prominence every single day. However, friends, what we need to do as believers in the truth is go back to the Bible, go back to the New Testament, and let's expose some of the lack of solid biblical foundation for these specific um, ideas that are out there. And so our priority, I believe, should be back on the genuine teachings of the Bible rather than to the alluring and elaborate yet misguided understanding by some of our fellow friends out in the uh, World Wide Web. So I just want to start off with then uh, uh, a term, the term Antichrist from a couple of websites, one website in particular, and I think this is the general idea, what they're looking at in these last days. It says here, a brief, this, this is the brief description of this one website of, of the Antichrist and the times we're living in. It says, quote, The Antichrist is a man who will appear on the world scene in the last days just before the return of Jesus Christ to the earth. Described in both the Old and New Testaments, he will be very, the very incarnation of evil, like in other words, the son of the devil. So he'll be the incarnation of evil, cleverly disguised as a dynamic, charismatic, visionary leader, something like this. He will astound the world with solutions to human problems. His empire will span every continent and his rule will be the most demonic individual the world has ever experienced. He will rise to world domination by declaring himself a man of peace but will later plunge the world into global war, as if that's not already happening. <laughs> Eventually, his true character will be revealed. He will be opposed to Jesus Christ and will offer himself to the world as the saver, saviour of humanity. He will control the global economy and force his followers to receive a mark on their hands or their foreheads. Most of the world will willingly follow him. To use a biblical phrase, they will believe a lie and be damned. Those who do not receive the mark will be hunted down and many will be killed. For a short period of time, he will become the most powerful man on earth. At the apex of his power, he will launch an all-out attack on Jesus Christ at a place called Megiddo in the valley of Jezreel in the central region of Israel. That battle is known as the bat as in the Bible as Armageddon. His reign of terror will come to a sudden end when he, will be, when he is destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ 
as he returns to the earth to set up his kingdom. The Bible says the number of his name is 666. Throughout history there have been many attempts to explain that number. All have failed. This is what the website says. 666 represents Satan's attempt to counterfeit God. 666 stands for the best man the best man can do. The Antichrist will be the end result of secular humanism. Man wholly apart from God. He will be the true Antichrist, both against him and place and in place of him. Um, so that's what one website says. Um, now another website in terms of explaining what the Antichrist is says this who is the Antichrist the Bible's answer the Antichrist is not merely one individual or entity for the Bible says there are many Antichrists first John 2 18 rather the term Antichrist which comes from a Greek word meaning against or instead of Christ refers to anyone who does the following so notice the first one we're reading th through was a very uh, the assumptions there there's a lot of assumptions being made using the Bible to explain their own interpretations right now here here we find just a another website now just giving us a, a brief description as what they believe the uh, the Antichrist is uh, so they they're starting off by saying it, there's many according to first John 2 18 against Christ that's what they're saying it means denies that Jesus is the Christ Messiah or denies that he's the Son of God first John 2 22 he poses the Christ God's anointed one pretends to be the Christ persecutes the followers of Christ falsely claims to be a Christian while practicing lawlessness or deception Besides speaking of individuals who take such actions as such as being Antichrist, the Bible also refers to them collectively as the Antichrist. 2 John verse 7. So there's a collective group, possibly throughout the centuries. The Antichrist first appeared in the time of the Apostles and has been active ever since. Bible prophecy foretold such a development in 1 John 4 3. So that sort of gives you an idea we have this idea that uh, the antichrist there appears a couple of times in the in first john then chapter two um the antichrist will act as uh, as we read briefly as satan's chief agent on earth during this period of time whenever if you're looking at the first interpretation or if you're considering this antichrist whether it's a person or just collective throughout the uh, generations but some see the antichrist as a sort of an evil twin of jesus christ uh, one who will forge a one world government throughout through promises of peace as as I mentioned in the first assumptions were made and when jesus returns he will expose the antichrist as an imposter then defeat him at the battle of armageddon and then reign with Christian martyrs or the Jewish martyrs of that time for a thousand years with the, the body of Christ. Um, and there's been, uh, throughout the uh, 2,000 years, there have been many people who have been considered the Antichrist. Don Francisco, Nero, Caesar, Yasser Arafat, Donald Trump, David Rockefeller, Theodore Roosevelt, Anwar Sadat, Larry Flint, Saddam Hussein, Pop, Pope John Paul II, Bob Dylan, Bill Gates, Billy Graham, Mikhail Gorbachev, John F. Kennedy, Henry Kissinger, Bill Clinton, Martin Luther, and Mussolini, and you can name a whole bunch of others, right? So, here's the point. There's never been a time in the last 2,000 years where someone hasn't predicted, one, the end of the world, two, who the Antichrist is, and it is like, okay, now we're sort of, the talk is now, this is the, the moment, we're at this point of the pointy end of 
of the time when this trickster, this earthly tyrant, will make an appearance. Although there's been many, many people who in the past have been um, accused of being the um, Antichrist, uh, the position also from the from the Protestants, from the Reformation, Martin Luther was convinced that, you know, he was, for example, living in the last days in the 16th century, uh, and he thought, well, the Pope fitted that criteria. Um, and so, even today, conservative Christianity over the last hundred years or so, uh, the Antichrist push has sort of multiplied and become just a, a category in its own, hasn't it? Like the rapture and other dominant ideas but this idea now is sort of permeating as things that people are starting to feel the pinch globally crisis after crisis um, and so they're just naming names picking people that they think are evil against Christ and uh, are just calling them out as being this antichrist this evil of depth of things okay so what should, how should we or we react to all these, this thing, uh, this um, going on as we see in the world and the uh, idea that this could be happening any moment? Friends, again, we should look at um, the Bible. As we said, um, this apparently superhero that comes on the scene but proves to be a villain, there is much speculation. Uh, some are looking at the book of Daniel like concerning the little horn of the king of the south, uh, the visions of revelation of the beast coming from the sea in Revelation 13. But let's look at what the scriptures say, okay? Let's take this approach, and this is pr the best approach, and then let's come come up with some sort of uh, at least biblical perspective, not just speculation and not just putting our little ideas in there because we want it to be a certain way. As revealed in the Bible, John is the one who actually uses the expression Antichrist. It's not found in the book of Revelation. He says in 1 John 2.18, You have heard the Antichrist is coming. 1 John 2.18, So now many Antichrists have come. Uh, continuing on, This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. In 1 John 4.3, This is the Spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming, and now is in the world already. It was already there in the first century. Second John 2, 1, 7, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, such as the one who is, who is the deceiver, and this one is the Antichrist. Now notice uh, if you go back to 1st John chapter 2 verse 22 verse 4 chapter 4 and verse 3 and 2nd John 1 7 there's this definite article as the T-H-E the indefinite and plural use the term Antichrist note that at least some sense the Antichrist was already present in 1st John 4 3 John was concerned about the spirit of Antichrist producing many Antichrists of his days. Remember what John was, why in 1 John, what he was really combating when he was saying, you know, look, he came in the flesh, we saw him, we touched him, we know he's real. And he was talking to um, Gnostics, those who were opposing this idea that Jesus came into the flesh. It was beyond their understanding. And he's saying, no, no. I was one of these people that witnessed Jesus. I spent time with Jesus. And he's asking them to repent of their sins in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. And, and throughout this uh, first chapter, he's talking to unbelievers. And so he's trying to convince them, hey, Jesus was real. And this is what he's saying here. He was concerned also a bit to the brothers that this Antichrist was around. He was around. Or they were around, and through these Gnostics teaching, he was trying to combat this idea that they were having against Christ Jesus. 
Now, this this is where the challenge is when you listen to some of the current thought on it. Is is he an individual, or is he um, a, a bigger person? Well, the definite article the leads many to anticipate an individual antichrist, a one person, right? That was from John Chrysostom early on, held that it was the resurrected Nero. And a lot of scholars today think that as well. Uh, some Catholic sources held that it would be an apostate priest or even a pope. Premillennialists and others look for a singular adversary to arise. But notice that the Apostle John said that there are many antichrists and was now, now already in the world leads others to conclude the Antichrist is an attitude reflected in both individuals and the system. Certainly when we think about John's letter, as I mentioned earlier, um, he was combating Gnosticism of his day, 2 John 1, 7. Protestant reformers like Luther and Calvin, as I said earlier on, identified the Roman papacy, papacy sorry, as the Antichrist. However, the evidence for a singular adversary, as we can see, therefore, is not as strong as many might suggest today. So this then leads us to what about then the man of sin or the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians? Won't he be the Antichrist? Well, let's have a look briefly. I'm not going to read 2 Thessalonians. I'm just going to quote the text and you can then look at it yourself. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 to 11 would be the, the whole passage. But his character is one of lawlessness, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Son of perdition is called, a man of lawlessness, man of sin. One begotten by, for destruction. Um, he doesn't, he's a rebel against God or he's God defying, he opposes God. And he therefore exalts himself above God, and he's called himself a God. He sits at uh, the throne of God, and he shows himself that he is God. From Second Thessalonians 2, two verses 5 to 8, there's an interesting situation appears. It, um, the present at that time, there was a restraining against the full-blown exposure of this character, or a revealing but the, the Thessalonians knew that there was a restraining him. And Paul had told them that he was with them. So, even so, the mystery of this lawlessness was, as Paul put it, and as John said, uh, was already at work with the Antichrist. Now, the man of lawlessness, he was already at work. His lawless influence was already spreading. But it was hidden like a mystery to be revealed only when that thing which restrains him from fully re being revealed would be removed. He would then be revealed when the straining, restraining force was removed. Uh, what, what is the decisive nature then of this person or, pers or system defeat? What is it? It is um, in second... Th um, where is it? Second Thessalonians chapter two verse eight. Uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ, he would be consumed by fire. In the end, will be similar to that those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of Christ. Second Thessalonians one seven to nine. So there's a choosing. People have a choice: obey the gospel or not. If you don't obey, you obey the gospel, then you're really putting yourself out of protection. Uh, and then. You know, really, you're in a very vulnerable position where you will um, have um, the wrath come upon you. And I would say the wrath of this anti or this man of lawlessness because he's all about destruction. Um, what's his relationship? Of course, the timing of his defeat is when the Lord is coming, the Lord will destroy the man of sin. And uh, this will happen at his arrival. And it says here that the Lord would destroy Satan at his coming as well at Revelation 20.10. So it's interesting. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, 9 and 10. What's his relationship to Satan? 
Well, it comes, he comes with the working of Satan, according to the work. So therefore, he will have powerful signs, uh, lying wonders, etc. And he will exercise unrighteous deception, a delusion, uh, deceiver. And amongst those who are perishing, those who do not love truth, but love the lie. So who or what is the man of sin or the son of perdition? Well, one view is that this man is one particular individual, as we read earlier. That's one particular view, who will rise, arise with great power and deceive many just before Christ returns. So therefore, who is the Antichrist spoken by John in 1 John 2, 118? Well, it depends who you ask <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, we've, it depends who you're really asking, honestly. And another view is that the the man of sin is a series of individuals. That's the other point of view. Perhaps a successive line of men. Okay, so... <clears throat> some some also suggest that the, the one that was holding back, the restraining from this uh, one being revealed, was the Holy Spirit. Some say it was the Roman Empire. Um that was restraining the lawlessness and that would just be the beginning and would eventually lead to the apostasy and revelation of the man of sin. But I'll, I'll let you decide what you think it is. I'm not going to say it's one or the other. So who is the Antichrist as we've seen in these just um, reference uh, texts that I've um, given to you? Well, Antichrist is applied by John to those in his day who deny Jesus coming in the flesh. Whether he was also in mind as an individual appeared to be later is not certain. We can't be clear on that. The man of sin is described by Paul as though it was an individual, but he presented restraint and a future revealing suggests that the possibility is that there's a maybe a series of individuals, right? Again, it would be foolish to try and speculate, friends. This is my point here. Uh, as many have done. It's, we're not, we don't have much to go on other than it was already he or individuals were already in operation in the first century. So to, to sort of neglect all that and just come straight full forward to the time of the end, whenever that is, because we are living in the last days and have been for 2,000 years. So any generation that, that went into these speculative ideas have long gone. Maybe we're going to be long gone, and then the next generation is just going to follow suit. Friends, we need to stop this speculative and make it into some sort of a doctrinal, um, theological sort of ideas that we can actually start preaching. We really can't preach something that is like specific to whatever we believe it is we just have to go by what the early writers have said about it and that's so far this is all they've said it's not very complicated in trying to understand that uh, the man of sin is described by paul or the man of this um, lawlessness uh, as it so, sort of seems to be a, an individual, but his present restraint and future revealing suggest the possibility that it could also mean a series of individuals. I mean, it's just, that's the option. Uh, and so I said that, I think I'm just repeating myself. Many, many people have spoken and have made speculations and have been proven wrong, friends, time and time again. So what's important then for us? What's the takeaway amidst all of this um, uncertainty? Well, we've seen uh, in these passages that Paul, for example, emphasizes the eminence in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 12, the eminence of Christ's return, cautioning against deception. The man of lawlessness, he said, was a current force yet restrained. The passage in what where we read, if you read Second Thessalonians two one to twelve, aims to alleviate anxieties 
and discourage excessive end time speculation. In the letters of John, when we look at that, contrary to popular perception, this figure is, uh, it doesn't seem like to be a singular person, the Antichrist, um, the end time characters, but represents those who deny uh, Jesus. The emphasis really there again is on sound doctrine, living out the truth and guarding against deception rather than the crafty elaborate of end time calendars. Uh, the book of Revelation, we didn't go into that, but 13, 1 to 4, it says there the dragon stood on the shore of the sea and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. Now people worship the dragon and the beast. Who is like the beast, it says? Who can make war against it? Now it's been explained again by many that this revelation is linked to figures like Nero. But again, it's symbolic language. And if it is linked to Nero, then it, it might follow the, uh, the words of John and Paul that was already in play, right? That this Antichrist and this man of lawlessness was already in operation. This uh, symbolic figure of the beast, a central player in this apocalyptic drama. Contrary to making, therefore, the beast a mysterious future entity, many scholars and consensus suggest a connection, as I said, to Nero. They do do that through, even through numerology. So Revelation, therefore, is challenging us to discern the realities of deception and evil in our world and to resist succumbing to falsehood. So there's this going backwards, really, in time. So as we unveil uh, the words of the apostles and we start seeing what the knowledge or the knowledge that they have revealed to us, the writings of Paul, John and Revelation aim to fortify believers against deception, against distortions of the truth as we hear today. The pressures to abandon our faith or to be worried about our faith and our salvation that we might lose it. And so, friends, what I'm encouraging you to do is instead of yielding to speculative timelines, let us remain rooted or grounded in the enduring truths of God's truth through these apostles. What can we learn from the past as we look into the past history of these believers who in, in their own times had uncertainty, had anxiety, about things um, of their day. What can we learn? Well, today, what we see is when people start speculating about these end times, people give up their jobs, they go part-time or whatever, they neglect their families. Um, but what the words of the Thessalonians is very, very important. The idea is don't panic. You have not been left behind. That was Paul's encouragement to those Thessalonians who were worried about their lives but to go on continue living your life today let us look at the wisdom trusting in god's word and not be distracted by excessive speculations so friends when we approach these type of texts and understanding let us approach it with humility and understanding from the indwelling spirit we have the holy spirit they are complex because we're getting many um, notable people telling us what the man of lawlessness is or who uh, the, the um, Antichrist and the beast. Friends, may our hearts uh, not be anchored in the uh, uncertainty of speculative thoughts, but really in the truth about Jesus Christ, his victory on the cross, where he sits today at the right hand of God, that he's indwelling us and he's um, and we're secure in him let us remain vigilant against the deception steadfast in sound doctrine and focused on living out our faith with grace and love yes and eagerly awaiting the return of our glorious uh, lord and savior jesus christ friends let us do that 
Let us finish off with a couple of words from 2 Thessalonians. As we do this, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm going to read from 9 to 12, or maybe 9 to 14. <clears throat> the coming of the lawless one is, a, is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth. Notice, they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Have you received the love of the truth? Friends, if you've accepted Jesus Christ, yes. He is the truth. He is love. He is grace. And if you've accepted Jesus, you have accepted the love of the truth. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that all may be condemned who do not believe the truth but had pleasure in the righteousness. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through the sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which he called you by our, by our gospel. Notice, it's by the Apostles' Gospel, the Gospel of Grace, by Paul's Gospel. That is what he received and he was spreading. And that's what the Thessalonians accepted by our Gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says in fifteen sixteen, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions, not traditions of men, the traditions which were you were taught, whether by word or our epistle, one way or another. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us, given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. So friends, let us uh, conclude with that. Yes, believe in the truth of the grace gospel. Have strong love for the truth. You have it in you now. Continue to fortify your love for the truth. Um, continually listen and depend on Jesus Christ. Only then can we be confident that we are in the right relationship with, with the Lord. Unlikely to be deceived by any individual or false system that might come before the Lord returns, which I believe is already happening now through the different Gospels that have been preached and the different ideologies that people have um, are scaring ones into the end times, the end times deception. So be wary of this, friends. Just know that you are safe and secure in Christ that your salvation can't be lost and your sins are totally forgiven, past, present and future. If you can understand at least that and continue being dependent on our Lord Jesus, our Saviour, you won't have an issue as regards being deceived by anybody. Thanks for listening. I hope this has been some sort of beneficial discussion in trying to make sense of all the speculative talks out there on the Antichrist and the end times. Thanks, guys. Take care.